Your average person wants seven or eight hours of sleep a night to feel good and proper the next morning. Not when you're working on a project like this. You just kind of end up going on into the night, trying to make sure that what you're working on is finished before you go to sleep. But the occasional dopamine hit. Hey. When something finally works makes it all worth it. Welcome to the software video. I want to use this to replace a Google Home or an Alexa smart speaker without needing internet access. And um, it still will have internet access for basic things like getting the weather or even just syncing time with the network, but those are perfectly valid uses of having internet access, whereas needing it to do basic maths or control my local smart home stuff isn't, and that's something Google Home and Alexa does need. So it won't ever be feature complete with the proper smart home products, but it's not meant to be. I don't need it to do everything. I'm still gonna be using the Google Assistant on my phone. I'm not entirely against data being collected to do things. I use the Google Assistant on my phone for navigation, and I accept that that means Google has to know where I am. But for navigation, they kinda have to know where you are. Whereas controlling my smart lights, Google doesn't need to get involved at all, but they do anyway. But before we get carried away, let's just get a functional pie. I chose 64-bit OS because I was expecting a performance increase, and the documentation does actually say you can do this in the bits that I hadn't read yet when I was setting it up. RAM access isn't a consideration for me since I've got the 4GB model, though actually after some testing you'd probably be fine with the 1GB Pi 4, which is good if you want to do this yourself because you get to save some money. Anyway, I tried to flash Pi OS first to my 32GB microSD, and then I, that was how I found out that microSD is broken half. Eventually I did manage to boot into Linux with it, but transfer speeds were really slow, both on the Pi and while flashing Pi OS to it from the computer, and also it seems like accessing files would often fail, but not always. It failed to boot multiple times and then eventually got me to a, a boot screen. So then I tried my 4GB microSD, which was fine until I actually needed to download anything and I ran out of space. I thought I'd just be stuck until I bought a new microSD card, until I remembered you can boot modern Pis even over the network or M.2, but also USB drives. So the USB drive won't be staying with us because it's physically massive, it's just a 16 gig one though, but it works for testing. One cool thing I learned while reflashing PiOS now to the USB stick was that from the Pi Flasher tool you can actually set up a Wi-Fi, SSH, your user settings, your host name, all from there, so when you plug the Pi in to power, it just appears straight onto your network. Though, if I wasn't accessing it over the network, I could show it to you on video using this. It's not related to the Pi at all, it is no name, but I found it at a car boot sale. It's like a knockoff Elgato Cam Link, and it's really cool, and it's how I got the uh, photo of the boot screen on the GitHub guide. Another big focus for me was efficiency. Not just because of the rising cost of living, especially because of the massive energy cost increases, though that does play a part, but also just a heat and environmental impact perspective. It would be nice for this to run cooler, because that will make it last longer, especially while Raspberry Pis are in short supply. And even though the effects are minimal, even on the scale of the Pi, let alone the scale of a whole house or a whole country, it's still important to do what you can to use less energy. So I set the GPU clock to zero megahertz, which I don't think will entirely disable it, but I don't need the GPU. So I've set it to as low as I can. I've disabled Bluetooth. I am gonna be using Wi-Fi because I don't think it's reasonable to expect most people to run Ethernet to a smart speaker. But uh, if you were to do this yourself, you could also disable Wi-Fi. And I've disabled all of the LEDs on the board. So that's the power one, the data one, and even the Ethernet LEDs in case I do plug it in. Another thing I did was use the light version of Raspbian. That would be annoying if you wanted to use the Pi as a small computer or anything general use because it it's just harder to navigate. It doesn't have a GUI, no desktop environment or anything. It just drops you straight into a terminal from when you boot up. But for something very specific use case like this, it means there's less resource usage, which means the actual voice recognition can happen faster and it's not doing anything in the background which helps power consumption. Though there is actually one place where I decreased efficiency. Not by a big amount, and so I think it's a worthwhile trade-off, but I've overclocked the Pi. As I film this, it's at 1.875 gigahertz, 
but I would like to try and up that while not upping the voltage too much, so I'll, I'll see if I can do that. But even though overclocking it makes it less efficient and use more heat, it's only actually ever using power while it's responding to what you're saying. Blueberry, what time is it? It's 29. I'm not overclocking it so it's always at 1.8 gigahertz. It's at its base clock when it's waiting for you to say something. Then you say something, it spikes up, and the faster clock speed, though it does use more power, lets it respond faster, which is important for a voice assistant. So I think the fairly negligible power consumption increase and technically stability decrease is worth it. I've had no stability issues with it yet, and so I think overclocking is the right move. And speaking of text-to-speech, I actually got a bit concerned because of it about showing it to other people. It just really didn't sound very good. This is what I sound like. And because it was Raspi's default choice, I thought that might just be representative of what locally run text-to-speech was. And even if the technology is really cool and, and the people who appreciate the fact that it's self-hosted might still find it interesting, if it sounds actively robotic, most people just aren't going to care. Luckily, that wasn't the case, and after switching to larynx and its southern British female voice, things actually sounded pretty good. This is what I sound like. The responses were less immediate now, because just generating the more natural text-to-speech takes longer, but thanks to how fast the Pi 4 is and the fact that I've got it overclocked, it's still pretty good. And in my experience, because I've used both Google Home and Alexa, still pretty competitive with Alexa. Alexa is really slow compared to the Google Assistant for some reason. And something similar but kind of opposite happened with the wake word. I thought I'd gone with the default option called Porcupine, but I'd actually picked the wrong one called Raspy Raven, which lets you set a completely custom one, but the training data for how it knows to detect the wake word comes from three recordings of you saying it, which it turns out just isn't enough. I was originally blaming my PlayStation Eye camera microphone because I thought it might just be not very good, and, and it probably isn't. But after switching to Porcupine and picking one from its pre-done list, I picked Blueberry, things were way more consistent and things work really well. The idea of having something entirely custom sounds good, though for demoing I did just do Hey Assistant, but I'm not confident that I could ever really get it responding well enough to me and other people and, you know, me when I'm doing a different voice. Maybe I'm tired and I say, hey, assistant, or, may or maybe I'm louder, maybe, maybe I'm far away. I'm not confident that I can get it working well enough, so Blueberry is good enough. At least for a little bit, though, things were back to being painless. I set up Home Assistant really quickly and easily, and all of my self-assembled WLED devices a GitHub link below if you're interested in that kind of thing. They all just appeared in Home Assistant automatically. They actually even pop up when there's a firmware update available within Home Assistant and let you do that entirely through their UI, which is really cool. But when I went to use Home Assistant as an intent handler in Raspi, or basically the thing that carries out what you have asked it to do with your voice, we were back in trouble. When I was trying to set it up, I assumed that the host name would be fine for everything. So that's assistant-main-node.local for this Raspberry Pi, rather than using its IP address. Because that was working to access it from other computers, I was trying to access Home Assistant with that, and it wasn't working. But to make things more complicated, I knew I'd probably end up reverse proxy in Home Assistant, which I should probably actually explain what that is. But anyway, since I knew I'd have to be doing that at some point if I wanted to access it remotely from an app on my phone, then I set that up and entered that domain name in the Home Assistant intent handler bit in Raspi, and that worked fine. So my theory about host names not being fine in that little box was wrong. So what ended up solving it was typing IP address into the terminal of the Pi. And if you wanted to do this from a phone or something, you can download the app Fing, or actually it's open source cousin Ning, to scan the IP address of everything on the network. And I basically, I just got the IP address of the Pi and then set it as a static IP so it would never change. Then going back to Raspi, and remember this is the Pi accessing itself just one thing on the Pi accessing another thing on the Pi. Now I'd entered the Pi's IP address, it worked. 
so we got there in the end. But now for another problem. I originally intended to keep using Home Assistant as the intent handler, since it just makes sense. Home Assistant is what actually talks to my smart devices, so it makes sense for it to be the thing that's carrying out what I ask the voice assistant to do. Home Assistant lets you talk to it through intents, different from Raspi's intents, or events. I chose intents at first because it was the default, and I did get it to work, but I couldn't figure out passing custom data to it, which meant I'd have to have an individual intent for each thing I want to do. So one intent for turning a light on, one intent for turning a light off, and you have to have both of those for each individual light. And that's not counting extra colors or brightness adjustments. There is probably a way to do it, but by the time I'd gained more knowledge about this, I'd switch to intents anyway, so I just never went back. But speaking of, intents also didn't work at the start because I didn't read the documentation properly and forgot to add this four character line to the top of the Home Assistant configuration file. Once I did that though, things were working and I figured out sending the custom data. So now I could just have an event called set specific light power and then Raspi will pass through which light I'm talking about and which state I'm talking about. So I don't have to have an event per each one of those. But getting things back from Home Assistant, not to do with the smart stuff, so like the, the weather or, or time, was doable, but a bit overly complicated and difficult. So instead, I'm going to replace Home Assistant as the intent handler with a Python script. And I'll still be using Home Assistant for controlling smart home things, but actually using it to do anything else, even though it's possible with custom sensors for things like the weather, or how originally I'd set a custom sensor that showed the time, and, and then I was accessing that. Things get really complicated using Home Assistant as an intent handler for anything other than just controlling smart home things, so we'll be doing that in Python. That also means, though, I have to learn how to use Python's requests module to send HTTP post and, and get requests, and I have to read up on Home Assistant's API. Luckily, I did that and eventually got things working. It was one of the more developer-y feeling things that I've done when writing code. Like any, any code writing is technically developing so software, but something about actually crafting a HTTP request, even if it's just in Python, and adding like authorization, like adding headers to authorize me with Home Assistant, um, it just felt really cool. <laughs> If I wanted to make things more complicated, I could write the intent handler in Rust, since that is a language I'm interested in learning, but I think all of its benefits would be wasted here. The speed advantage wouldn't really do anything for me, and now I'd have to compile it each time I make a change. Right now with Python, if I want to make a change, I don't have to restart anything. I can just write what I want it to do, save it, and ask it immediately. If I wanted to learn something new and get more into learning Rust, this would probably be a way I'd do it, and I might in the future, but not for now. Learning the basics of raspy sentences was easy enough, and even passing special things through in a JSON file to the intent handler, or substitution, so swapping something I say for something else to send in the JSON file, like internally, was easy enough. But then when I wanted to do that for multiple things without things getting really complicated, that took ages to figure out. Basically just really complex substitution was really awkward, but I eventually got it figured out. I, I have a slots file for all of my colors or lights, and then I access that from within a variable in the sentences section. And so now I can have multiple choices for what to call a light. Like, the same light can be called door light, or door LEDs, or door frame light, and because of that slot file, they all mean the same thing. So if I say, turn on the door light, here is the actual sentence in Raspi that does that. Um, it listens for turn, and then the state name, so the state is, the state is on or off. Um, and then the, I think, is an optional word, and then it checks the entity. I'm saying. So the, the entity is the light. Am I saying the door light, the bedside light, any other lights I might have? That's what that means. And it was just really cool being able to see all of this behind the scenes, like writing my own sentences. So I could say the same thing in a certain order, like I could say, turn the light on 
or turn on the light. And they would mean the same, and I've wrote them to mean the same. Or understanding voice assistants having optional words. So if you say the word, it's still valid, but if you don't say the word, it's fine to just skip it. Or, like I mentioned before, having to access devices through like variables that are connected to slots that are substituting what you're saying for the actual device's name on the back end. It's really interesting and really complicated when you're first getting into it. Um, it was really annoying to get working, but it works now. One thing that felt really good was adding its ability to do maths. It, it sounds silly, but just I didn't have to look up any documentation, all the troubleshooting I did was for reasons that made sense, I understood what was going wrong immediately, and I just didn't have to second guess or google every other thought out of my head. And so when I became more comfortable, I actually used this as a chance to go back and improve things that I'd previously done but could be better. I was still using the basic time getting stuff from Raspi's examples, and even though it works, it works in 24 hour time, which makes way more sense to read, going from 12 to 13 rather than 12 to 1. No one says it's 20 o'clock, even though that would probably be better, and this didn't even say that. If it was on the dot 8pm, it would just say it's 20. So I wanted to fix all of those little things. The final result was this. Blueberry. What time is it? It's 6.27pm. And it took about 15 minutes to fix. I also went back to the math section to fix some issues with decimals. I would pronounce this string as 2.56, but it would say 2.56. And even though I get quite annoyed by the fact that it says 56 rather than 56 after the decimal, it's still perfectly understandable what number it's trying to convey. Not saying the point isn't. So now, rather than just directly speaking the output of the calculation, I save the output as a variable, and then just as it's being spoken, replace any dots with the word point. It still doesn't handle recurring numbers very well, although I could actually fix that by just rounding everything to three or four decimal places. I'll, I'll, I'll implement that in a sec, but now it works a lot better. I'm also going to add the weather to this section, even though I hadn't added it previously, so it's technically not a quality of life improvement, and it wasn't too important to me since getting the weather on your phone is really easy and often just part of your lock screen. I still wanted to try, it works fine, I just talked to a weather API. I originally wanted to be able to do it without an API key, but I couldn't find any more active weather APIs where you don't need an API key, so after I gave in, just signed up for free with a weather API thing. It worked fine and it sounds like this. Blueberry. How hot is it? It's currently 17 degrees and clouds. One thing that took forever to get work into a satisfactory amount was sound notifications. Originally when a timer ended, it just said timer complete. Blueberry. Set a one second timer. But that was obviously just for testing, and what I wanted was for a sound to just keep playing until you said blueberry stop, and it would stop. Getting sound to play was fairly easy, since I was already using the command line utility aplay to play any sound generated by the text-to-speech, so all I needed to do was use Python's subprocess module to call aplay and then the sound I wanted to play. That worked, except I couldn't make it stop. Ideally, the timer sound keeps on going for a little while, so you have time to notice it in case you don't immediately. But, having a long sound, it, it would just play forever. I could stop a play by typing sudo kill all a play into the terminal, but I can't call sudo from within the Python script, so I couldn't do that. I could have a short sound play once, but again, that's unideal because I might not notice it. I spent about an hour trying to figure that method out, but I just didn't manage to. After going to sleep and waking back up again, I decided to try it a different way. I don't like that I have to install something extra, but I could use Pygame. It takes quite a bit more code to initialize everything, but I got to exactly the point we were at before. I've got audio playing, and it's not stopping. So from here, I realized that I could- I can't have two instances of the same Python script directly talk to each other, not in a way that I understand. But, I could make it so when I say blueberry stop, the script creates a file. Then, the other script is running a while true, just infinite loop, while audio is playing, that is looking for that file. Then when it sees it, it does pygame, mixer, stop, and it should stop the audio. 
and it works. Except it doesn't. All of the testing so far was done before integrating with the assistant, and I just can't use Pygame here, apparently. But we've still got some options, <laughs> we're not done yet. So, next, I thought, what if I just had a small, little audio file that I could play multiple times, rather than stopping one big one? Then I could use Raspi's PlayWave API endpoint, and then just send the audio to Raspi, and while it's playing, be checking if the stop file exists. Then if it does, once that audio file's done, I will stop sending it. That didn't work, because I couldn't get the requests module to repeat something it's done before. I'm not sure why that was the case, but in a loop, and, and the loop was working, it would play the first time, then not again. But we've learned enough to get this working. I went back to Aplay, but with the same idea as with the API endpoint. We have a while loop going, and inside we play a sound with Aplay, and then below it we have an if statement that checks whether a certain file exists, and if it does, we break the loop and then delete that file. Then we just have to add another intent uh, to Raspi and another section to the Python script that says make the file that that one is looking for when I say blueberry stop. And it works. I and I absolutely hated all of that. That was about, that was three and a bit hours of problem solving. And that's where we are now. It can do maths, set timers, give you a greeting, that's only really a half one, tell you the weather, turn any smart home stuff on or off, or set the colors of lights or any other value a smart home thing could take, and it's been a really good learning experience. Still to come is adding more nodes to the network and seeing if I can make that work, hardware improvements, just adding more features whenever I have time, and showing off the final implementation, and more. But it's already good enough that I can replace my Google Homes I got for £3.50 without a power adapter from a car boot sale and I use with a wrong voltage but still working power adapter of my own. It's good enough. Though, these might actually inspire some of my final hardware choices for it, since this form factor for smart home stuff looks kind of ideal, and it, they're actually big enough that a Raspberry Pi, without any special 3D printed enclosure, can fit into this format. So we'll have to see how that goes, no guarantees, because I'm not actually done yet. This I'm only recording this mere hours after completing the sound notifications thing in the previous section, so I just don't know yet. If you want to keep updated with what's going on, if you like this and other ones of my videos, maybe consider subscribing. I'll have the GitHub links for Home Assistant Raspi and my own guide I'm working on below. And if you think you know something better than me and you want to help, get in contact with me through the comments. I'm interested. On the end screen now, you'll see a video the algorithm thinks you'll like, and either my latest upload or the next video in this series, depending on whether it's out yet. Hopefully you enjoyed.